Clemson University uh, and the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism are honored today to have with us the man whom I think is America's greatest historian of the American Revolution. Gordon, o uh, Gordon S. Wood is the Elva O. Way Professor of American History at Brown University, where he has taught since 1969. He received his PhD from Harvard University, and he's also taught at Harvard, uh, the University of Michigan, as well as lecturing at many of the world's greatest universities. Professor Wood is the author, as I'm sure you know, of many books, including The Creation of the American Republic, which won the Bancroft Prize and the John Dunning Prize in 1970. He's the author of The Radicalism of the American Revolution, which won the Pulitzer Prize for History and the Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize in 1993. Uh, his more recent works include The Americanization of Benjamin Franklin and Revolutionary Characters, What Made the Founders Different. He is currently working on a volume in the Oxford History of the United States dealing with the period of the early American Republic from 1789 to 1815. Professor Wood is also a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Association. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce and ask you to join me in welcoming Gordon S. Wood to Clemson University. Well, thank you very much. It's, I've been to Clemson uh, twice before, once in the 1970s and once in the 1980s, and you've had a lot of growth in the last 20 years, so uh, there are a lot of places I don't recognize. But it's, I'm delighted to be back, and, and don't believe what uh, Professor Thompson told you. He was a superb student in every way. Um, well, this is uh, why America wants to create democracy everywhere uh, throughout our history. It goes back to the revolution, which began on April 19th, 1775, with what, as Emerson put it, in the mid-19th century, a shot heard round the world. That, in fact, I think, was how the 19th century saw the revolution, as an event of worldwide significance. It was an event that opened up a new era in politics and society, not just for Americans, but eventually for everyone in the world. And it's that perspective on the revolution uh, one that's not always grasped, even by us Americans, uh, that I want to uh, look at uh, this afternoon. It was America's destiny, said the Hungarian patriot Louis Kossuth in 1852, to become the cornerstone of liberty on earth. Should the Republic of America ever lose this consciousness of this destiny, Kossuth went on in a speech given while he was uh, here in the States trying to raise money for the 1848 Hungarian Revolution, should it ever lose consciousness of that destiny, that moment would be just as surely the beginning of America's decline as the 19th of April, 1775, was the beginning of the Republic of America. Now, I don't know whether uh, that moment of decline is at hand or not, but in the aftermath of September 11th and our uh, involvement in Iraq, we are certainly at a significant moment in our history. We now dominate the world as no nation in history ever has. Our military expenditures are equal to those of the next nine nations put together. We have over a million men and women under arms all over the world in 40 countries. Now this may not be a, an empire in the traditional meaning of the term, uh, but it's clearly clear that we ha exercise an extraordinary uh, degree of dominance over the world. Is this the fulfillment of our destiny as Kossuth saw it? to build liberty everywhere? Or is it a repudiation of our destiny? Have we lost our consciousness of being the bearers of liberty? Have we become just another great imperial power? Did our invasion of Iraq in order to bring democracy to the Middle East mark the end of our revolutionary tradition? Or instead, was it a fulfillment of it? Now, it's hard for many people, I think, to think of the United States as a revolutionary nation operating out of a revolutionary tradition. For the past half century or more, the United States has so often stood on the side of established governments and opposed to revolutionary movements that to describe America as a revolutionary state seems to be an oxymoron. So reactionary did many intellectuals think American policy was during the Cold War that they could only conclude that our involvement in the world was due solely to American capitalism and its needs. <clears throat> 
Even the Gulf War of 1990, 1991, was explained simply in terms of oil. Now, no doubt such economic explanations can make sense of particular events at particular times, and the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, may be one of them. But they cannot do justice to the incredibly complicated and ideological relationship that we've had with the rest of the world throughout our history. Economic considerations, for example, can never adequately explain America's tragic involvement in Vietnam. But America's revolutionary tradition can. Now, this afternoon, very briefly, uh, no doubt too briefly, I want to explore some of the origins and the nature of this revolutionary tradition and try to suggest some of the ways it has affected and shaped our attitudes towards the world. I think that by examining the character of, of, American, of the American Revolution, we can get a clearer understanding of just what an ideological people we've been and perhaps a new perspective on the whole of, of American history. Now, the Revolution is the single most important event in our history, bar none. Not only did it legally create the United States, but it infused into our culture our noblest ideals, our highest aspirations, uh, our beliefs in equality, in liberty, in, in constitutionalism, and the pursuit of happiness by, by ordinary people. It was the Revolution that gave us our obsessive concern with our own morality and our messianic sense of purpose in the world. The revolution made us an ideological people. Now, I, I don't think we like to think of ourselves as an ideological-minded people. Ideolo ideology seems to have no place in American thinking. The word sounds European. It conjures up systems of doctrine, doctrinaire ideas, and dogmatic abstract theories. It could have hardly have much to do with the practical, pragmatic people we Americans have tradi uh, traditionally thought of ourselves being. And certainly ideology, it used to be thought, could not have been involved in that most practical of revolutions, the American Revolution. Now, few historians of the American Revolution believe that anymore. It now seems clear that the revolution was very much an ideological movement involving a fundamental shift in ideas and values. In fact, I, I would go so far as to say that the revolution was as ideological as any in modern Western history, and as a consequence, we Americans have been as ideologically minded as any people in Western culture. Now, of course, we Americans have vaguely known all along that we are peculiarly dedicated to intellectual principles, and that adherence to these intellectual principles has been the major adhesive holding us together. As you know, we Americans don't have a nationality the way other peoples do. Our sense of being a distinct ethni eth uh, ethnicity uh, was not something we could take for granted or today can take for granted, the way most Europeans could and can, which of course is why we can much more easily absorb immigrants than they can. A nation like ours, made up of so many races, so many ethnicities, could not assume its identity as a matter of course. Our American nation had to be invented or contrived. At the end of the Declaration of Independence, uh, you may recall, the members of the Continental Congress mutually pledged to each other to each other, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. There was nothing else but themselves that they could de dedicate themselves to. There was no patria, no fatherland, no nation as such. In comparison, in comparison with the 229-year-old uh, United States, many European states are new, some of them created in the 20th century. Yet these European states, like Poland or, or uh, Czechoslovakia, new as they may be, are undergirded by peoples who had a previously, a previous sense, a pre-existing sense of their own distinctiveness, their own nationhood. In the United States, the process was reversed. We Americans created a state before we were a nation. And much of our history has been an effort to define the nature of that nationality. In an important sense, we Americans have never been a nation in any traditional meaning of the term. It is the state, the constitution, the principles of liberty, equality, and free government that make us think of ourselves as a single nation or a single people. Now, what's the nature of this ideology created by the American Revolution? Looking back from our vantage point at the beginning of the 21st century, what, what strikes me as most extraordinary about the revolution is the world-shattering significance that the revolutionaries gave to it. Now, in light of the fact that we did, did eventually become the greatest power the world has ever seen,
It requires an act of imagination to recover the audacity, the presumptuousness of, of Americans in 1776 in claiming that their little colonial rebellion possessed universal importance. After all, these 13 colonies made up an insignificant proportion of the Western world, numbering perhaps two million people, huddled along a narrow strip of the Atlantic coast 3,000 miles from the centers of civilization. To believe that anything they did would matter to the rest of the world was the height of arrogance. Yet the revolutionaries and their heirs in the 19th century sincerely believed that they were leading the world toward a new libertarian future. Our conception of ourselves as the leader of the free world began in 1776. Now what made this presumptuous attitude possible? What made Americans in 1776 think that they were on the edge of a new era in history, pointing the, the way toward a new kind of politics and society and a new sort of world? What in short transformed their revolution into something more than a mere colonial rebellion was the revolutionary ideology of republicanism. Now it's only in the past generation or so that, that we've come to understand just how ideologically charged with republicanism the 18th century was. In our own time, where republicanism is so much taken for granted and where much of the monarchy that remains seems so benign, half of the European Union, for example, are monarchs, uh, it, it's difficult to appreciate the power that republicanism had for 18th century intellectuals. Indeed, republicanism was as radical for the 18th century as Marxism would be for the 19th century. Republicanism and the Republican tradition framed for all sorts of political and social critics of 18th century Europe, monarchical Europe, the moral perspective with which they confronted the dominant monarchism and materialism and corruption of their age. This republicanism was not an indigenous ideology, peculiar only to Americans, but was in fact a product of long existing heritage of, of civic humanism originating in the classical literature of, of antiquity with Livy, Cicero, Tacitus, Sallust, and others, revived by Machiavelli and others in the Renaissance and carried into the 18th century by nearly everyone who claimed to be enlightened. These Republican values, articulated most vociferously but not exclusively by the popularizers and heirs of the 17th century Republicans in the English-speaking world, Harrington, Milton, Sidney, promise far more than the elimination of kings and new elective governments. Republicanism, in fact, promised an entirely new morality. It necessarily involved the character and culture of the society and thus possessed immense significance for any people who should decide to become Republican. Now, you have to understand that the word, what they really meant was what we now mean by democracy. So uh, that, that's important to keep in mind, elective governments that are not monarchies. Everyone in the 18th century knew that republicanism required a special kind of people, a people who possessed virtue, as they, the term they used, who were willing to surrender their private interests for the sake of the whole. Monarchy was so prevalent because it was based on the assumption that people were incapable of this kind of virtue. Monarchy presumed that people were selfish, corrupt, self-interested, and that without the existence of a strong unitary authority of monarchy, the society would fall apart. Theorists of the 18th century, like Montesquieu, would have understood perfectly what happened in the Soviet Union in, in following uh, 1989, and in Yugoslavia as well, when Tito uh, left. When, when, a, when a strong unitary authority was removed, those states fell apart. People asserted their various selfish ethnicities and interests, and, and, and they ran amok. Montesquieu would have said that the people of those states lacked sufficient virtue to hold their societies together. Monarchies thus had advantages that republics lacked, and if you substitute in our own time authoritarian governments for monarchies, you can begin to understand how insightful someone like Montesquieu was, which is why uh, these monarchies had existed everywhere since the beginning of history, and why authoritarian governments still flourish. Monarchies were utterly realistic, or cynical, you might say, about human nature. They didn't expect humans to be anything but corrupt and selfish. Monarchies or authoritarian governments possessed a number of means for holding a diverse and corrupt society together. They had powerful single executives, a multitude of offices, complicated social hierarchies, titles of honor, standing armies, and established churches in order to maintain cohesion, to maintain cohesion in their states. But republics possessed few of these adhesive 
attributes. Therefore, order, if there were to be any in a republic, must come from below, from the virtue or the selflessness of the people themselves. Yet precisely because republics were so utterly dependent on the people, they were also the states most sensitive to changes in the moral character of their societies. In short, republics were the most delicate, most fragile kinds of states. There was nothing but the moral quality of the people themselves to keep republics from being torn apart by factionalism and division. Republics were thus the states most likely to experience political death. Now, to the 18th century, the decay and death of states seemed as scientifically grounded as the decay and death of, of human beings. It is with states as it is with men, was a commonplace of the day. They have their infancy, their manhood, and their decline. The study of the life cycle of states, focusing on political disease, was of central concern to the Enlightenment. For through such political pathology, and they used that term, people could further their knowledge of political health and prevent the process of decay. With these kinds of con concerns, the whole world, including the past, became a kind of laboratory in which the sifting and evaluating of empirical evidence would lead to an understanding of social sickness and social health. Political science became a kind of diagnostics, and history became an autopsy of the past. Uh, you, you cut out the states that had died, you cut them open to find out why they had died. Uh, that's what history was about. Of course, the most important states that had died were the republics of antiquity, especially, of course, Rome. The death of Rome fascinated the 18th century. It was inevitable that Gibbon would choose that subject for his great work. He wanted to write a great work of history, and he toyed with other things, the Swiss republics, the Dutch revolt, but he ended up with the only subject that fascinated the whole society of the time, the decline and fall of Rome. Everybody wrote on the decline and fall. Montesquieu actually wrote a version of the decline and fall of Rome as well. Uh, reading the great Latin works of antiquity, the 18th century came to realize that the Roman Republic became great, not simply by force of arms, nor, nor was it destroyed by military might. Both Rome's greatness and its eventual fall were caused by the character of its people. As long as the Roman people maintained their love of virtue, their simplicity, their equality, their scorn of great distinctions, and their willingness to fight for the state, they attained great heights of glory. But when they became too luxury-loving, too obsessed with refinement and social distinctions, this is, runs through all of that Latin literature, which makes it the fundamental text for all of, of Western history, and maybe world history. When they became too luxury-loving, too obsessed with refinement, too preoccupied with money, and too effeminate to take up arms themselves on the behalf of the state, uh, their politics became corrupted, selfishness predominated, and the dissolution of the state had to follow. Rome fell not because of the invasions of the barbarians from without, but because of decay from within. Now the lesson for the revolutionaries in 1776 was obvious. If their experiment in republicanism were to succeed, the American people must avoid the luxury and corruption that destroyed ancient Rome. They must be a morally virtuous people. Now, Americans had good reason to believe that they were ideally adopted or, or adapted for Republican government. Most of them, at least the white portion of them, were independent yeoman farmers, Jefferson's chosen people of God, who were widely regarded as the most incorruptible sorts of citizens and the best foundation for a republic. There were no titled aristocrats in America and none of the legal distinctions and privileges that encumbered the European states. All in all, Americans in 1776 thought that they were the special kind of simple, austere, egalitarian, and virtuous people that enlightened social science said was essential for the sustenance of a republic. Beginnings of so-called American exceptionalism come out of this, uh, these ideas. Their moral equality thus became a measure of their success as a society, and this inevitably gave their new republic an experimental and problematical character. So the Americans began the revolution in a spirit of high adventure. They knew they were embarking on a grand experiment in self-government. That experiment remained very much in doubt during the first half of the 19th century, especially during the Civil War, when monarchy still dominated all of Europe. Hence the importance of, of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, 
where he described the Civil War as a test of whether a nation conceived in liberty could long endure. The idea that uh, our Republican government was a perilous experiment was part of our consciousness from the very beginning, and, and Lincoln was very much uh, 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 preoccupied with that. Now, all of this Republican ideology assumed tremendous moral force, and when fused with Protestant millennialism, it gave Americans the sense that they were a chosen people of God, possessing peculiar qualities of virtue with, special, with a special responsibility to lead the world toward liberty and Republican government. And the Americans began their experiment with, every high, with very high hopes that other peoples would soon follow their lead in throwing off monarchy. But they also knew that it wouldn't be easy since republicanism required a peculiar moral quality in its people. So naturally, at first, they saw the French Revolution as a copy of their own revolution, and they welcomed the effort. Everybody did at the outset, but its rapid perversion and excesses ending in Napoleonic despotism disillusioned many Americans about the ability of Europeans, or the French at least, to emulate them in becoming Republican. They came to see the French Revolution as simply an abortive attempt to imitate their successful American effort at establishing republicanism. Far from changing things for the better in Europe, the French Revolution had failed, and thus the Americans' optimism about the future was tempered with some doubts. Now, these doubts soon played into the American attitudes towards the Latin American colonial rebellions that broke out in the early decades of the 19th century, with the Spanish and the Portuguese throwing off Spain and Portugal and becoming republics. Now, if any revolutions were emulations of the American Revolution, these certainly seemed to be. And of course, Americans like John Adams and Thomas Jefferson welcomed them. But at the same time, they were skeptical of the South American ability to create free Republican governments. Did they have the stuff, the virtue, that Republicans were made of? I feared from the beginning, wrote Jefferson in 1821, that these people were not as yet sufficiently enlightened for self-government, and that after wading through blood and slaughter, they would end in military tyrannies, more or less numerous. Yet, as they wished to try the experiment in republicanism, I wished them success in it. Thus, Americans from the outset had an ambiguous attitude towards republican revolutions in other parts of the world. Naturally, there's no hostility only sympathy and an enthusiasm mixed with some skepticism, a well-wishing mingled with a kind of patronizing pessimism, bred of an anxiety that other peoples would not have the sort of social and moral qualities necessary to carry through a successful Republican revolution. Nonetheless, Americans continued to believe that they, and not the French, were the revolutionary nation par excellence, carrying the van being in the vanguard of the international revolution. We were the source of it, not the French. And some Europeans agreed with them. Here's Count Metternich, um, the chief minister of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire who uh, organized the Congress of Vienna in 1815 and was dominated Europe. He's excoriating the United States for proclaiming in 1823 the Monroe Doctrine, which as you know, told the Europeans that they no longer had any role to play in, in the new world. In their indecent declarations, these United States, said Metternich, I have cast blame and scorn on the institutions of Europe most worthy of respect. In permitting themselves these unprovoked attacks, in fostering revolutions wherever they show themselves, in regretting those which have failed, in extending a helping hand to those which seem to prosper, they lend new strength to the apostles of sedition and reanimate the courage of every conspirator. If this flood of evil doctrines and pernicious examples should extend over the whole of America, what would become of our religious, religious and political institutions, of the moral forces of our governments, and of the conservative system which has saved Europe from complete disillusion? That's Metternich talking about these United States. Now, despite promising not to intervene in Europe's internal affairs and expressing a desire to have no entangling alliances with, with Europe, most Americans remained very concerned what went on there. We were not isolationist in attitude, in mind. We simply weren't going to get involved directly. They were, they were reluctant, of course, to, to, to send any troops, uh, uh, any, any, anything that might endanger our own revolutionary Republican experiment. Believing that people who were ready for Republicanism would sooner or later become Republicans, as they had, Americans in the 19th century concluded that they could best accomplish their mission of bringing free governments to the rest of the world simply by existing as a free government 
by being, in a sense, an exemplar to the world. William Wirt, who was Patrick Henry's biographer, the first biographer, William Wirt of Virginia put this very nicely in a speech he gave in Baltimore in 1830. We stand under a fearful responsibility to our creator and our fellow citizens, Wirt told his audience. It has been his divine pleasure that we should be sent forth as the harbinger of free government on the earth, and in this attitude we are now before the world. The eyes of the world are upon us, and our example will probably be decisive of the cause of human liberty. So you can see where, where Lincoln is drawing from in his, all of his speeches during, dur during the war. So Americans watched and encouraged all the 19th century revolutions. They did not intervene indeed, but they did in every other conceivable way. Individuals raised money for the rebels, and some went off to fight on behalf of these various revolutionary movements. In all the revolutionary uh, European revolutions of, of the century, the Greek revolt of 1821, the French constitutional transformation of 1830, the general European insurrections of 1848, and the overthrow of the Second French Empire and the establishment of the Third French Republic in 1870, in all of these uh, revolutions, the United States was usually the first state in the world to extend diplomatic recognition to the new revolutionary regimes, which were almost every, everywhere uh, uh, put down. After all, in the Americans' eyes, these European revolutions were simply efforts by oppressed peoples to become like them. All species, you might say, all species of the same revolutionary genus Americanus. Americans never felt threatened by these revolutions and had no fear whatsoever of the spread of revolutionary ideas. There was, of course, one exception uh, to this enthusiasm for revolution, and that, of course, was the Haitian Revolution. We did not recognize this black Haitian Republic until the Civil War, Lincoln's administration. But we welcomed all the other revolutions and toasted those revolutionary pa patriots like Kossuth when they came to America in search of, of money and support. Now, naturally, this encouragement of revolution did not adhere us to the European uh, uh, monarchies. But 19th century Americans, in their geographical separation, simply didn't care what European monarchs thought. We were proud of our revolutionary example and simply assumed that we were the cause of all the revolutionary upheavals in 19th century Europe. When the Habsburg monarchy protested American sympathy with the Hungarian Revolution of 1848, Secretary of State Daniel Webster openly insulted the Austrian-Hungarian minister. He made no attempt to deny the charges leveled by the Habsburg minister. Instead, he said that the United States would accept nothing less than full American responsibility for the upheavals. He told the minister, and I'm quoting him here, that the prevalence on the other continent of sentiments favorable to Republican liberty is a result of the reaction of America upon Europe, and the source and center of that reaction has doubtless been and now is in these United States. Webster then went on in one of the, to say in one of those gratuitous insults for which American, uh, American diplomatic messages in the 19th century were famous, that in comparison with the great extent of the United States, the Habsburg monarchy was but a patch on the Earth's surface. Uh, now, because 19th century Americans frequently resorted to such spread eagle bombast, uh, but actually did very little to aid the revolutions, many historians have concluded that our revolutionary sympathy was something of a fraud but I think such a conclusion misunderstands the peculiar character of America's 19th century revolutionary tradition. Because of their Republican assumptions, Americans believed that any revolution in Europe would have to come from, from the oppressed peoples themselves and from the moral force of America's example as, as a republic. But they never had any doubt that America was the center of the international revolution. Now, this American ex uh, ethnocentricity is, is mind-boggling when you think about it. Uh, the best example I know of is a message from President Grant uh, in 1870 to the French government sent in response to the French overthrow of the Second Empire and the establishment of the, of the Third Republic in, in 1870. Despite America's determination not to intervene in Europe's affairs, Grant, uh, uh, President Grant told the French, and I'm quoting him here, we cannot be indifferent to the spread of American political ideas in a great and civilized country like France. I mean, imagine, it was as if the French had no revolutionary tradition of their own to draw on for their third republic, and they had drawn on the United States. Now, we don't know what the, 
Foreign Office thought of this message, which must have uh, raised eyebrows in, in the French uh, Foreign Office. Now, because of the slowness with which republicanism spread, 18th, 19th century uh, Europe remained monarchical. Uh, Americans increasingly came to conclude that they were the only successful Republican state in a corrupt world. And millions of people in the world seemed to think so too. The migration to the United States uh, between 1820 and 1920 of over 35 million people, one of the great folk movements of all time, uh, refugees from monarchism coming to America, as we saw it, uh, seeking freedom and, and uh, free government, gave us a conception of ourselves as a chosen people, uh, gave that meaning a chosen people, a less divine and a more literal meaning that people had chosen us to come, and confirmed for Americans their preeminence as a revolutionary people. Now, it's within this 19th century context that I've been describing, this, revolu this, this revolutionary tradition of republicanism and this belief by Americans that they were in the vanguard of history, leading the world towards liberty, that we can begin to comprehend the extraordinary American reaction to the Russian Revolution of 1917. In the full sweep of American history up to that time, no foreign event had such a dramatic and searing effect on Americans as did the Bolshevik Revolution of November of 1917. After that, event, that momentous event, our understanding of ourselves and the world became very, very confused. Now, at first, you, you remember the Russian Revolution takes two stages. The spring, uh, in March uh, 1917, the Tsar was, was overthrown and you had the formation of a provisional, the Kerensky government. Americans welcomed this Russian Revolution as they had uh, welcomed earlier anti monarchical European revolutions. Seven days after the Tsar abdicated, the United States extended diplomatic recognition to the new Russian government, the first power in the world to do so, as we had done earlier. Think of that. President Wilson now thought he had a fit partner for a League of Honor, a league which Wilson hoped would be a means for the worldwide extension of democracy or republicanism. But in May 1917, the American ambassador in Moscow wrote back to the United States that he expected Russia to come out of its ordeal as a republic with a government founded on correct principles, that is to say, principles similar to those of the American Republic. Yet with the Bolshevik takeover of the revolution in the fall, in November of 1917, all this initial American enthusiasm completely disappeared, quickly disappeared. Instead of its firmest friend, the United States suddenly became the bitterest enemy of the Russian Revolution. Instead of quickly extending diplomatic recognition to the new regime, this new Bolshevik regime, as American governments had traditionally done throughout the 19th century, the United States withheld diplomatic recognition from the Soviet Union for 16 years and four American presidencies, making the United States not the first, but the last Western power to recognize this new revolutionary regime of the Soviet Union, this new communist regime. Now, in light of America's early revolutionary tradition, this is a remarkable turnabout. A turnabout, however, that is explicable only in terms of that earlier revolutionary tradition. What was now different, what caused this abrupt change of attitude, was the nature of the Bolshevik appeal, the new character of the communist ideology. The Bolsheviks claim not simply to be leading another anti-monarchical Republican revolution in emulation of the American or French models of the late 18th century. The Russian Revolution was not another species of the revolutionary genus Americanus. It was a new revolutionary genus altogether. The Bolsheviks said that their communist revolution represented a totally new departure in world history. And others saw, saw it this way. The Swiss playwright and essayist, uh, essayist Herman Kesse, for example, said in 1918 that it is now certain that mankind must make up its mind either for Wilson or for Lenin. The great antagonism that immediately sprang up between the United States and the Soviet Union rested not simply on the exigencies of power politics or in the circumstances of contrasting marketing systems, but more important on the competitiveness of two very different revolutionary traditions. The Cold War really began in 1917. The Soviet Union threatened nothing less than the displacement of the United States from the vanguard of history. 
The Russians, not the Americans, now claim to be pointing the way toward the future. And more alarming still, there were some American intellectuals in the 1920s and 30s who agreed with that claim. For the first time since 1776, Americans were faced with an alternative revolutionary ideology with universalist aspirations equal to their own. This ideological threat was far more serious to us than anything the Russians did technologically, either in developing the H-bomb or launching Sputnik, for it seemed to make America's heritage irrelevant. For if we Americans were not leading the world towards liberty and free government, then, then what was our history all about? With this dramatic emergence of an opposing revolutionary ideology, Americans in the 20th century grew more and more confused about themselves and their place in history. They could not very well stand against the idea of revolution, but at the same time, they could no longer be very enthusiastic about revolutions that they assumed would be communist. With the enunciation of the Truman Doctrine in 1947, the United States, for the first time in its history, committed itself to supporting established governments of free peoples against the threat from subversion from armed minorities, which are pres presumably communist, or armed minorities within the state, which we presume would be communist. Our Cold War struggles with the Soviet Union eventually culminated in our disastrous intervention in Vietnam in the 1960s. Most Americans thought they were simply following President Kennedy's call in 1961 to pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend or oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. That's Cold War rhetoric at its greatest. Only this time, support for, the liberty, meant, support for liberty meant supporting existing governments against revolution. The fundamental threat to the meaning of our history posed by a rival revolutionary ideology blinded us to the nationalistic and other ethno-cultural forces at work in the world. In such an atmosphere, it became difficult for us not to believe that every revolution was in some way communist, if not explicit, at least latent. And consequently, our def definition of free governments was stretched to extraordinary lengths to cover virtually any government that was non-communist. The ironies, of course, are abundant. We spent 10 years between 1979 and 1989 helping the Taliban in Afghanistan withstand a Soviet takeover. <coughs> now, it'd be a mistake, however, to see our support of corrupt or reactionary regimes as the direct response of American capitalism or the result of some deep-rooted abhorrence of revolution. Many of our Cold War actions, clumsy and misguided as they often may have been, represented our confused, I think, and sometimes desperate efforts to maintain our universalist revolutionary aspirations in the world. Our Point Four program, which was uh, uh, helping out people, accompanied the Truman Doctrine. The Peace Corps coincided with our involvement in Vietnam. All are linked. All are cut from the same ideolo ideological cloth. All were expressions of what was becoming an increasingly dimly perceived sense of America's revolutionary mission in the world. Now suddenly in 1989, with the collapse of the wall, all this changed. The Soviet Union fell apart, and with it, its revolutionary aspirations to make the world over as communists collapsed as well. Joel Barr, an American engineer who had de defected to the Soviet Union in 1950, told a Los Angeles Times reporter in 1992 that he had been wrong about communism. I believe that now history will show that the Russian Revolution was a tremendous mistake. It was a step backward, he said. The real revolution for mankind that will go down for many, many years was the American Revolution. Well, as you know, we're living in an extraordinary moment in our history. It's not at all clear what the consequences of the momentous events that we're living through will be. At first, I think September 11th seems to have uh, increased, not weakened our desire to dominate the world. President Bush came into office opposed to nation building. Then he became determined to do just that in Iraq. Not, it seems, uh, now it, it, it seems uh, uh, not all that successfully after four years, at least so far. Lots of Americans, like Tom Friedman of the New York Times, initially welcomed the idea of bringing democracy to the Middle East. It seemed a way of solving a whole host of problems. But the continued violence in Iraq has drained much of this initial confidence away, and large numbers of Americans are now calling, as you know, from our withdrawal from Iraq. We seem, I suppose you could say, we're very much an all or nothing people. It's very difficult for us to maintain a real politique attitude towards the world. We have to either be saving the world or shunning it. In the 1990s, some intellectuals were bitterly opposed to any sort of messianic impulses coming out of our 
revolutionary tradition. Others in the 90s thought that we had become a middle-aged nation not all that different from the other nations of Europe. Now, in the first decade of the 21st century, we seem to be in a quandary about what to do, about what our role in the, in the world ought to be. We remain the sole superpower, but still unsure of quite how to use that power. And the current, I would call them empty, hollow campaigns for the presidency on both sides uh, are, are not helping us understand at all about what our role in the world ought to be. Uh, I think our revolutionary heritage still commands the attention of many people in the world. Our devotion to liberty and equality, our abhorrence of privilege, our fear of abused political power, our faith in constitutionalism, and individual liberties. I think commands attention to among a lots of people throughout the world. This was brought home to me very, very poignant, very dramatically three decades ago at a talk I gave at, at, at Warsaw in, in 1776. I was sent over to tell the Poles about the American Revolution, the bicentennial of our revolution. And, and it was an incident that, that I'll never forget. Um, now, you have to understand, this is 1776. It's before uh, the end of the Cold War. It's before solidarity had formed. This is Poland still under the, under the control of, of the Soviet Union. Uh, and at the end of this lecture I gave on the American Revolution, very conventional lecture, a young Polish intellectual uh, ra raised a hand and got up and said, you, said, Professor Wood, you left out the most important part of the American Revolution. Well, naturally, I was stunned. I left out the most important part. And she says, and I said, what was that? And she says, you never mentioned the Bill of Rights. And it's true. I, I hadn't. Those you know, constitutional protections of individual liberties against government, I, I had taken the Bill of Rights for granted. But this young Polish woman uh, living under a communist regime could not take such individual rights for granted. So we forget, I think we take for granted the important things. This example of this Polish intellectual showed me that our republic, at least back then, was still a potent experiment in liberty worth demonstrating to the rest of the world. And I hope, I hope that idea of America uh, will never die. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wood, for that wonderful talk. Uh, we've got lots of time, I think, for uh, questions. Uh, and Professor Wood has uh, um, very kindly agreed uh, to take questions. So uh, the floor uh, is now open uh, to you all. Please. Yep. Yes, there's one in the middle there, is there? I, it's hard to see. So just stand up and say your question. There's one. Uh, I was wondering if you might uh, define when, when Americans as a whole truly develop a, a national understanding of the American Revolution that drew no sectional uh, boundaries. When, when, and if you might uh, explain when and why that, that happened. Well, obviously, in the antebellum period, um, the understanding of the revolution uh, began to, to deviate. Uh, the, the, the North had one understanding and, and, the, and the South had a, had a very different one. And, and that uh, climaxed with, with the Civil War with two different interpretations of what the revolution had been about. Um, I think Lincoln tried to express what um, was a mainstream uh, opinion. And, and, and I think it tr tried to transcend the North and South in the sense that we, we were a special people with a special destiny, and that's the line he took. Uh, and, and we were on trial, so to speak, for free government. Um, and I think that's how he mobilized the North. I've always felt that the, the Civil War, explaining the South's secession is not difficult, you know, why the South left. I think what's difficult is to explain is, is why the North cared. And, and uh, they cared enough to, to fight with you know, 300 and some thousand casualties in the North, and the South had the same numbers, uh, because of this vision that Lincoln kept alive, that this was something worth fighting for, this I image. So you have a different interpretation, but out of the war, and in, in the decades following um, Reconstruction, you begin to form 
a, a more united people. So I think by the beginning of the 20th century, and, and Paul Buck's old book on Road to Reunion captures this, people came together with a, with a common understanding. But then at that moment, of course, you begin to have uh, scientific history, professional history, academic history emerging, which began to criticize the revolution. And so you had a complicated period there at the progressive era. But I think it's by 1900, there's a common sense. The North and South had, you may not, you South Carolinians may not, some of you are native here, may not believe that, but I think the North and South had come together uh, reasonably well by, by 1900 um, uh, with a common interpretation of, of, of the revolution, if that answers your question. But certainly they had a different view of it uh, in, in the antebellum period. The South claiming that they were the true heirs, to, with some truth, uh, to, to, because it's the North that changes radically in, between 1776 and, and 1861. The South remains, uh, remains very much located in the 18th century with an aristocratic, uh, slaveholding uh, society uh, dependent on, on staple products. It's the North that becomes business oriented and, and commercially develops and the separation. So the separation is not only social, economic, cultural, but also histor they, their sense of history differs and what the revolution meant uh, separates. But it's brought back together, I think, by the end of the, but I'm not an expert on the late 19th century, but that would be my off the cuff answer to your, your question. Any other? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, uh, our separation of church and state, which is virtually peculiar to us, although the Europeans have it de facto because they lost all interest in religion, essentially. But uh, our separation is, re is really unique in the world. And uh, I was at a conference in Prague last, uh, last spring, and it became clear we had uh, Muslims there and, and people from other parts of the world. Our, our separation of church and state has no relevance whatsoever to the much of the, certainly not to the Muslim world. They can't conceive a religion being uh, separated from politics. So uh, that's something we've got to just accept. And if you want to have any Muslim state, they're just simply going to be, it's going to be part of their politics. And when you think about it, uh, if religion, I mean, the reason why states have always been concerned traditionally with religion is because religion is important. And if something's important, then the state wants to be involved in it. So our separation of church and state, which came out of the experience of the 18th century, really fed not by intellectual notions, not, not really by people reading John Locke, because all he believed in was toleration. He didn't really believe in separation of church and state. It came out of the exigencies of, of circumstances that we had a multiplicity of religions that had to get along. And the, the religions concluded that if, I, if my group can't control the apparatus of the state, I better make sure the state is neutralized so that my enemies don't get control. And that's really the source of our separation of church and state. Uh, it, it really doesn't really come out of Jefferson's uh, ideas of rationalism or out of uh, John Locke. It comes out of this sheer fact that many religions created a problem and, and people concluded rather reluctantly, because most people wanted to control the state. And they did in Massachusetts and Connecticut where they had a majority until eight, in 1833 in Massachusetts. The Bill of Rights did not apply to the, to the states you know, until the 20th century. So you could have an established church, taxpayers paying money to the, to the uh, church uh, of, of Congregational Church of Massachusetts, Massachusetts. But the real source of it is the realization that you better neutralize your, the state because you can't be sure that your enemy, the Presbyterians can't be sure that the Baptists aren't going to get control, or vice versa. Or the Quakers aren't sure that the Anglicans might gain control, so we better just make sure the state's neutralized. That's the real source of our, and it came reluctantly, and, and, and to the amazement of people, religion didn't die. It flourished, 
in the 1830s and 40s, it's, we were um, the most lively Christian nation in the world, which we still are. Uh, now that message, whatever we have, is no relevance whatsoever to the Muslim world. They're simply, it, it's just beyond their conception. Religion and politics are entwined, they're going to be. What you can preach, I think, is toleration. And that's all you could preach. And that, I think, is what the message that we should be uh, preaching. Not attempting to impose separation of church and state, but to say, look, tolerate people that disagree with you. And, and I suppose we should have a little more patience with the Sunnis and the Shia. And you realize that we went through, the Western world went through hundreds of years between Catholics and Protestants killing each other in horrendous numbers. Now, they didn't have bombs to blow up people like we, we have today, but they were fighting. 30 Years' War was one of the most brutal wars in, in all of, of history. Uh, and, and it took a long time for people to reach the conclusion that maybe we better tolerate uh, minorities. And then from toleration came a leap into separation of church and state, which is religious liberty. And that's, that's rare. That was our, our contribution. The English had toleration. The Dutch had toleration. They weren't persecuting people. They weren't hanging people uh, for their religious beliefs. But they didn't have religious liberty. It's we, Americans, who created what I would call true religious liberty, which, but again, it comes out of, it's interesting. We just don't have anything to say to the Muslim world on this subject, perhaps except toleration. And I think that's, that's something, of course, they're going to have to reach themselves. It, it took the West. Uh, you know, centuries to reach that conclusion, and many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives. And we finally reached the conclusion we better tolerate one another. And so it may take a while for, the, for, for these Muslims who are fighting with one another to, to reach the same conclusion. It's kind of a pessimistic, but we ought to be at least aware of our past Western's history so that we have a little more patience with what's going on, for example, in, in Iraq, which is mind-numbing, the idea that people would who are Muslims blowing each other up. But Christians were doing that too, so we have to keep that in mind. Yes, sir. Um, you spoke of like, the rise and fall of Rome, and um, history shows us that every major power has fallen. Um, it is the destruction of the fall of the power. And you spoke of like, the presidential candidates we have coming up in how they are a bit weakened. Has our, uh, our view of revolutionary liberties gotten so far from our forefathers? Well, yeah, I should think we, we should know that we're not going to be the greatest power forever, whenever that's going to be. But, uh, you know, the Romans who were declining didn't know they were declining. Uh, that, that comes in after, after the fact, you, for the most part. There were some contemporaries who thought that things were getting out of hand. They didn't like, you know, androgynous dress, men and women dressing with the same clothes. Those kinds of messages that kind of make you uneasy about your own time. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen. I, I don't think we're going to go out of business for quite a while because we have uh, this extraordinary wealth and extraordinary military power that no state comes close. But everyone has a sense that if China uh, and maybe India too, if they can um, mobilize their energies. I mean, the, the Chinese are very entrepreneurial people. All you have to do is look at the overseas Chinese to see, you know, why Singapore, Hong Kong flourishes because of these this Chinese entrepreneurial skills. If they mobilize a million, a, you know, a, a billion people, wow. Uh, uh, of course, the resources that will be used up are <laughs> going to be enormous, but that, that will make uh, our 300 million seem tame. But that's a long way in the future, I, I think. And the same was true of India. I, I don't think the Indians are, are, are as equipped to, to do that uh, yet. The Chinese seem to be much more welcoming, despite being a communist regime, more welcoming of, uh, of capitalism. But I, I don't think we're in any immediate stage. I think it is important, and, and this is what I meant by the presidential candidates, it, there's a, a reluctance to talk about um, what our role in the future should be because it's too risky. Whatever you say is going to be alienate somebody and create problems. So uh, we're going to have to, you know, there's just no room for that kind of statesmanship in a presidential campaign, uh, given the nature of our our politics. Any everyone's walking on eggshells. Any slip, and they feel that they could lose the, the the whole business. So everyone is very cautious. They get on message and they say 
what that message is and they don't deviate. It's, it's just unfortunate. But it, that's democracy because you know, you see what happens to them. They make the slightest slip and boy, the press is all over them and suddenly they can lose the, the whole caboodle. So you're not gonna get enlightened uh, develop, I mean, uh, statements about what we ought to be doing in the world. Um, I suppose you could say the ones who are most open to this are people who have the least chance of making it. Like Joe Biden tends to be more frank and, and, and but he has you know, no chance. He's, I think he's gunning for the to be uh, Hillary's uh, Secretary of State. Uh, I don't think he intends to make it as president. But, but um, it's very difficult to, you know, for us to work out what we are supposed to do. And it, it'll have to be improvised. When the new president comes in, they'll be, they'll, it'll all be improvised. And, and that's when you'll find out what we're supposed to be doing. And it's unfortunate because we should be able to vote for people that we think uh, have some vision of what the world is going to be like. Uh, but that's the nature of our, our politics, unfortunately. Um, but that's the, it's the nature of dem democratic politics um, and, and the media. Uh, and uh, uh, there's no getting away from that. We can't stop it. Yes, ma'am. Wait. I'm sorry. Did Islam, what? <laughs> Libertarianism. Okay. Well, I'm not sure I, I'm an expert enough on, on modern day uh, libertarianism. Uh, I think the sense of liberty being uh, a supreme value was of course very important to the founders. But they at the same time were not, um, they differed on this issue of, of government. Uh, Hamilton and the Federalists were, I guess you'd call them big government people, and Jefferson and Madison and the Republicans, the Jeffersonian Republicans, uh, were minimal government. Uh, and they differed quite dramatically on this to the point where they were at each other's throats in a way that even our present day politics doesn't match. Um, so although both would have said liberty was very important, I, I don't think um, they, they, they would understand, okay, I don't know, Ron Paul, if you think of him as a, a libertarian, I, I think they would think of that as, as probably an exaggeration. Although Jefferson would be sympathetic to it because he really did believe that the least government was the best. And that's because he had an utter confidence in the natural sociability of people. And that was the, that was the liberal view, if you will, enlightened view. I don't want to use liberal because that has connotations of the present, but in the 18th century, that's what liberal, like liberal arts, that's what the enlightened view was, that people are naturally sociable and they'll get along with one another without force from above. And if the opening paragraph of, of Thomas Paine's Common Sense, and Paine is, is right in the Jeffersonian camp on this, that people are naturally sociable. Government is a source of evil. Government comes in and creates distinctions. Monarch, they're thinking of monarchy, of course. Government uh, uh, confers honors. It, it, it gives monopolies and charters to people and, and creates distinctions and creates jealousy, and it's bad. It's the source of all evil. So the source of, uh, of, uh, of, of society, uh, society ought to be left alone because it's nat the people are naturally sociable. It's a utopian vision in a sense. Jefferson uh, uh, and, and Paine both bought into this. It's, it's conventional, um, enlightened thinking. Uh, and it explains his notions of minimal government. Now, if you believe that human nature isn't quite so rosy as Hamilton did, he didn't believe that. He thought that was pie in the sky stuff. Why would you believe that people are selfless and gonna get along? They have to be controlled to some extent from above. So Hamilton is a tough-minded, and Washington bought into this, a tough-minded, realistic view of human nature. People are selfish, they're self-interested. Now the best way to run a government is to harness that self-interest for the good of the state. That's Hamilton's program. He's a, he, he, and, he and, and, and Jefferson have a diametrically opposed views of human nature. Jefferson has a magnanimous view, we're good-hearted, we're sociable, we get along. If, we're only, if we only get the government out of the way, which creates our jealousies, uh, we'll get along. We're hung, we, we just love one another, essentially. And, and Hamilton says that's hogwash. So they really differed in the most fundamental way. 
from one another on this basic notion of, of human nature, and which led to their varying views of what the government should do. Hamilton would probably be most pleased with our modern government. He would have loved the Pentagon, CIA, all these standing army under, you know, million men and women under arms. He would have said, this is it. This huge bureaucracy, this is what I wanted. And Jefferson would be appalled. Uh, they, he wanted nothing like this. And he didn't want, I mean, it, it comes down even to their, to their attitude. The Jeffersonian view of, of war was to avoid it at all costs. And that's why he, he experimented with his, what he called a liberal experiment in, in his embargo, in what we would call economic sanctions. Anything is better than sending troops somewhere. Use economic sanctions. And so that's still the, 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 the alternative we have to military force. Uh, and, and so Jefferson and Madison, uh, they clung to that really desperately. Uh, and and uh, the, the embargo, of course, was a disaster, but Madison thought if it had been kept a few months later it would, uh, more, it would have worked. So this is, these are people with very different views of what the world's like, what human beings are like, and what America should be doing. And Jefferson and Madison are sort of utopians, which is what Hamilton said. They're pie-in-the-sky dreamers. They don't have any, they don't have their feet in the ground and so on. Um, the War of 1812, which is considered by historians to be a disaster, Madison and most of his re fellow Republicans thought was a great success because he went through the war without enhancing executive authority. He didn't make any effort to build up the executive. And, and of course, that meant that the, you know, the capital was burned and so on. He didn't care. He says, that it's not worth it to build up the executive. And of course, every subsequent war, the executive has been built up uh, right up through our own time. So uh, with the war on terror. So uh, they would be, you know, Madison and Jefferson would be appalled at what our subsequent history of war making, in particular, because they said that's the threat to liberty. Now, how all this relates to libertarianism, I don't know, because, uh, uh, but you can see w w what they believed. And, but both would have said liberty is, is, a, is a great value. Uh, equality, too. I mean, they both, they, they all, especially the Jeffersonians believed in equality. They meant essentially equality of opportunity, not equality of, of condition. They didn't expect everybody to be the same, although they did worry if, if the rich got too much, too rich and the poor, you had too great a gap between rich and poor. They worried about that, but they certainly were accepting of distinctions of wealth as long as they were based on merit or talent. And, and that, so it's equality of opportunity that they both, both sides agreed with. Or, Celebrated. Yes, sir. Is it more of an economic or political interest that led to the impetus behind the revolution? Economic or political? Yeah, more of a, do you want to self-govern or do you want to be able to engage the future? Oh, I, I think that's an impo impossible uh, to, to answer. I mean, I think uh, ostensibly it was all about politics. Now, there were economic interests at stake, and you can find an example of a, of a, of a guy, a, a little. Uh, guy in a western town in, in Rhode Island who had come out of nothing and had built up a, a, a timber trade. Uh, so he was the richest man in this little town of Smithfield, Rhode Island. And, and no big deal, but he was the big, he had come from nothing to be the richest man in this town. And he, his, his wealth was coming from the, from the timber trade. And when the Brits cut off, uh, his trade was, was with the West Indies and they cut this off. Uh, he felt his whole livelihood, his whole position in the world is threatened. So for him, He's a natural patriot because of that. But I don't think you can explain Sam Adams in those terms. I don't think you can explain John Adams in those terms. So you have, in particular cases, you have people's interests are being stepped on, but everything is being voiced in terms of, of liberty, of freedom. We've got to be free to run our own affairs. And I think that's the way it was voiced, and, and people were sincere about that. Um, now, as I say, there were examples of people whose economic interests were touched, but I think it's impossible to say, well, it was one or the other. Yeah? Well, like Milton Friedman said that uh, economic... Who did? Who said? Milton Friedman, that economic oh. freedom was uh, necessary for political freedom. Did they understand that? Did that go hand in hand? Or? I don't think they had a modern capitalist notion uh, of that. They would have uh, probably not. They would have thought of political freedom first. Um, Certainly, there was no real conception of economic freedom among the mass of the population. They were eager for price fixing. They were eager, during the revolution, a, a whole lot of populist uh, 
sources. We're trying to fix prices, control uh, 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 the economy in various ways that backfired for the most part. But there were merchants who, un who had a glimpse of what you might call an Adam Smith view of the economy, not having read, not because they read Adam Smith, because they just saw how things worked. But it, the, from the popular, from the bottom up, most people did not understand uh, economics. In fact, the term wasn't even used. So, uh, and, and most of them reacted in the way you see people in the third world reacting. Uh, they're just going to step in and try to control prices which, of course, backfires completely. Uh, someone like Jefferson and Madison never understood what a bank was, neither did John Adams. Uh, that's why Hamilton was so successful. He's the only one, in, <laughs> apart from Robert Morris and a few other merchants, who understood how a bank worked. Uh, you have to understand economic literacy, if you will, was very primitive, even among educated people. So uh, it took a while. It's not really until the early 19th century that people begin to understand what I would call uh, the marketplace. And they, they actually thought of, they thought of it, in, it's actually in the world of opinion comes first. They began to glimpse the creation of public opinion. And how does public opinion created? By hundreds of thousands of people uncontrolled voicing their opinions in a kind of uh, competitive marketplace, if you will. And it ends up with something that they call public opinion, which you can have confidence in. And people began to use that model to explain the economy. It's sort of in reverse. They began to see that you could have um, wealth being created without anybody controlling it, just allowing people to do their own thing. So that comes later than even the creation of what they call public opinion. It was hard to come by. Most people, and it's still true today, most people's instinctive reaction is to, you know, politicians to step in and try to do something, which usually screws it all up. Uh, you know, you have a, a, the price of gasoline goes up, and so they, they think, oh, God, the oil companies are doing something. We better step in and do something. They call the oil CEOs before the Congress. They never explain why the oil prices go down. They just always think that the oil companies are raising them, uh, and they don't understand the marketplace. It took a long time, I think, for Americans to grasp that. But some were doing that by, I would say, by 1820. You have a widespread intellectual understanding of what we would call, they don't call it capitalism yet, but the, the capitalist system, a marketplace of competing prices that ends up doing good things without, with, you know, in the Adam, sense, Adam Smith sense, with everybody behaving selfishly and yet creating a, a public good that no one of them intended. That's, a, that's, a big, that's the big achievement. Very hard to grasp. It was for them, too. There's one question here. One, one more question. In, um, well, you Go ahead. Well, I understand uh, the problem between, we, we, lo we love immigrants, but we don't like it, illegal immigrants. Um, immigration, of course, in the 19th century, there were no illegal immigrants, since anybody who came here came. We had no visas, we had no restrictions, except uh, on Asians uh, late in the century. But otherwise, Europeans, any Europeans could come. It's only when we're at the beginning of the 20th century we began to get flooded with Italians and, and Russians and Jews, that people became alarmed, that culminated in the uh, Immigration Restriction Acts of 1920. So we're going through a kind of period that we went through in the early 20th century, and we ought to have some historical knowledge of that to get a handle on what our own time. Uh, I guess, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm no expert on this. I have my own views on this. I, I think I'm optimistic. Uh, we got, if there are 12 million, who knows how many there are. If there are 12 million, we're not going to, we're not going to extradite 12 million people. So what are you going to do? I, I got to work out something. But the, but people who live in Colorado or, or New Mexico or Arizona aren't able to look at it in a, in a, a disinterested way, uh, impartial way, they, they, they see the problem right up front and they're concerned about it, and perhaps understandably so, but I would be more optimistic. I think assimilation will take place. Uh, the Hispanics are into marrying, which is the great assimilator, at a very high rate, 
Um, the only group that doesn't intermarriage at, at a high rate, unfortunately, is black-white, which is about, I guess, si five or seven percent, something like that. But every other group, Asians are marrying non-Asians at 50 percent, uh, and Hispanics are. And that will ease the problem over the years. And uh, I guess we just have to absorb those, but we have to obviously develop control so that we're just not inundated. So I guess my, they, they have welcomed immigration at first. The Federalists turned against it. They wanted immigrants at first, but in the, in the 1790s, because all these Irishmen were coming in, fleeing um, a Britain that was, was clamping down on editors and so on because of the, of the terror and the fear of France and revolutionary ideas, we had a lot of radicals coming into the country, and suddenly the, the Federalists turned on it and passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, as you know, which has uh, damaged the Federalist reputation ever since. Uh, and that's the first uh, change of our, uh, our attitude towards immigration. Um, but when Jefferson comes in, he, he, he just does away with those, and, and we, we went back to our open um, you know, open uh, boundaries, and as I say, 35 million Europeans came over 100 years. That's an enormous number of people uh, for a society which at the beginning was, what, 4 million in 1790, and over the next 100 years, 35 million came from abroad, although we were reproducing at an extraordinary rate ourselves, at the, you know, the fastest growing population in the Western world, doubling every 20 years. So. I guess to, to some, I, my own view is that we've got to be generous to immigrants. The Republican Party is destroying itself with its attitude. Uh, it, it, these Hispanics are going to vote. They're going to have long memories. Uh, even when they're fully assimilated and fully American, they're going to remember that the Republican Party stood against their fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, whatever. And um, I, I know from my own um, state of Rhode Island, the uh, memories are long. Uh, the, the Yankees tried to withstand or discriminated against Irish and Italian immigrants coming into the state. And it was fine for a while as long as they were in majority, but now they're in a tiny minority and they're paying. They paid for that. And that will happen to uh, the Republicans, I'm afraid, because they've taken this stand. So I think it's, um, it's a mistake. I would be optimistic about immigration. I would try to welcome, uh, as I would certainly welcome the people who are already here. But I would, uh, I would certainly want, you don't want to pr allow a, a, a full inundation. So you have to put up some kind of controls to control. But you, you know, your guess is as good as mine what will happen in the future. Nobody can predict the future, especially historically.